Welcome, Bishop Thomas. Thank you, Ron. I guess the first thing we should explain to our viewers, because they can see us and let our listeners know, is that in accord with all the instructions that have been coming from our governor and all those very, very careful uh, hygiene recommendations and health care uh, guidelines. Both Ron and myself are social distancing at this moment. We're at the table, but we are at least six feet apart, Ron. Actually, we're more than six feet apart. And I just want other people at home to recognize because some of you can see us on Facebook. For those who are listening on the radio, please know that we are in the same room, but that we are social distancing in accord with the guidelines. Always a safe practice, especially during these uh, unsettling times. And just as we've been asked, we're trying to help our listeners and viewers also. We're trying to model what all of our listeners and viewers should be doing as well. And Bishop, as you might imagine, a lot of questions uh, about this uh, this current pandemic and how the diocese and, and really how life is impacted uh, at this time. Yes. Uh, I would uh, suggest that before we get to the gospel, uh, that we start with one of those questions. Thank you, Ron. Please do. Right, This uh, question uh, in from Kathleen at St. Mary's Parish. Dear Bishop Thomas, thank you for your clear leadership in this time of uncertainty and tumult. I know you met with the other bishops in Ohio, but was wondering if you have talked to bishops uh, from other areas of the country um, regarding the current pandemic. How about local and state officials like the governor and the mayor of Toledo? Does or has your role as bishop of the Diocese of Toledo changed at all during this time? So thank you, Kathleen. Of course, first of all, to all our viewers and listeners, I hope you know how I join you in thought and in prayer as we navigate what I've called these uncharted waters of a health crisis and a pandemic such as this coronavirus COVID-19. We have been trying to do our very, very best on a pastoral center, diocesan level, and at our local levels at all of our parishes to try to respond to our, the pastoral needs of our people and tr try to make every effort to let you know that we are close to you, even though we have to practice, quote, social distancing, that doesn't mean that we're distanced from one another in prayer and in thought. So we are very close to you in those ways. And I have to also, in answer to uh, Kathleen's question, certainly say that I'm grateful for your observation. We're trying our best to offer leadership in this time of tumult, Kathleen, trying our best, obviously, with all of you to keep calm, to respond logically and prayerfully and appropriately to all the directives coming from the government. I hope you know, too, you asked about meeting with the Ohio bishops. I had a meeting uh, with together in person with the Ohio bishops. At that meeting, in fact, we were to meet personally with the governor. We were in Columbus. However, we were only able to meet with him by telephone because he was actually in conference call with the White House and other governors. He left that conference call to speak to us. And so that was an extraordinary moment. We've also met, obviously, by teleconference. We are following direction and guidance that is, from our USCCB, so all the bishops are in consort from the entire country addressing this issue. You asked also if I talked to other officials. I've spoken to some health officials from our local counties throughout our 19 county diocese. And of course, uh, does this role, does your role as bishop change? Well, I think all our roles change, don't they, in this moment? So I think all of us are trying to respond as best we can. And as you know, the very first response of the bishops, which came on the 16th, or excuse me, on the 12th of March, was that we directed our people for three weekends, remember, to be mindful of not gathering if it was at all possible, that we dispense them from the obligation of coming to Mass, and we asked especially those who may be in some way compromised in their health, especially the elderly, to take the option not to attend Mass. You can understand as quickly as things have been uh, developing, it was only then on the 16th of March that then the bishops, having met and having decided that we would follow the guidance of the governor and that we would suspend all public masses and ask our faithful to remain home out of care 
for all of our Catholic faithful and out of care for our whole broader community. As you all know, this now has ramped up into the pandemic that it is. We are all experiencing fear and anxiety and trouble. We don't know where it's going, but we stand together, and we hope that simply doing the most normal things, that's why we're doing these shows, folks, to try to do the most normal things and stay out there with you and in contact with you might help all of you, because now as we tape this show, we have just been informed by the government that the governor, as of tonight, has asked all of us as a directive, as an order, that they, we would be in place at home, except for all of those who need to be serving or working because of their, of their job and the nature of their job. So, Ron, that's where we are. I hope that's helpful to Kathleen. And I know we'll take all the rest of our questions, folks, are on this critical issue because of where we find ourselves at this time for this show today. Yes, obviously, there's a lot of concern, and these are unprecedented uh, actions. Uh, exactly, Ron. Have not happened in any of our uh, memories. And we're making every effort to keep people safe, to do our best to address our health issues, doing our best to join together in prayer, despite that we are not capable right now of receiving the Eucharist in our persons and attending Mass in person in communion with one another in church. We're doing our best to exercise the best things that we can do to stay healthy and at the same time to stay spiritually in tune with our Lord and with one another as a diocese. Amen to that. Thank you, Ron. Well, Bishop, before we get to uh, the other questions, uh, let's get to a recent gospel. Please. Uh, th this from the uh, fourth Sunday of Lent. And folks, this, of course, was just this past Sunday's gospel, and it is the familiar gospel of the man born blind. And it is somewhat lengthy, and I know you heard it uh, in many uh, social media ways on Sunday, but we'd like to do it again today. And our gospel is from John. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither he nor his parents sinned. It is so that the works of God might be made visible through him. We have to do the works of the one who sent me while it's day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground. He made clay with saliva, and smeared the clay on his eyes, and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed, and came back able to see. His neighbors and those who had seen him earlier as a beggar said, Isn't this the one who used to sit and beg? Someone said, It is. But others said, No, he just looks like him. He said, I am. So they said to him, How are your eyes opened? He replied, The man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and told me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went there and washed and was able to see. And they said to him, Where is he? He said, I don't know. They brought the one who was once blind to the Pharisees. Now Jesus had made clay and opened his eyes on a Sabbath. So then the Pharisees also asked him how he was able to see. He said to them, he put clay on my eyes, and I washed, and now I can see. So some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a sinful man do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said to the blind man again, What do you have to say about him, since he opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. Now the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and gained his sight, until they summoned the parents of the one who had gained his sight. They asked them, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How does he now see? His parents answered and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. We do not know how he sees now, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He can speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, and for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone acknowledged him as the Christ, he would be expelled from the synagogue. For this reason, his parents said, He is of age. Question him. So a second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, 
Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. He replied, If he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know is that I was blind, and now I see. So they said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I, already, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? They ridiculed him and said, You are that man's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but we do not know where this one is from. The man answered and said to them, This is what is so amazing, that you do not know where he is from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if one is devout and does his will, he listens to him. <clears throat> it is unheard of that anyone ever open the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he would not be able to do anything. They answered and said to him, You were born totally in sin, and you are trying to teach us? Then they threw him out. When Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, he found him and said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered and said, Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him. The one speaking with you is he. He said, I do believe, Lord, and he worshipped him. Then Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see might see, and those who do see might become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not also blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you are saying, We see, so your sin remains. It's a beautiful gospel. Your thoughts, Bishop? Thank you, Ron, so much. Folks, obviously a lengthy but a powerful gospel of the healing of the man born blind. And just this past Sunday, on March 22nd, when we were not able to attend public Mass, together with so many priests and parishes throughout our diocese, I was able to celebrate Mass without a congregation at our cathedral chapel. And we live streamed that Mass. And in fact, folks, that Mass is still available on our website for you to see. So, Ron, I could tell folks, just go there and listen to my homily. But I will offer just a few thoughts, folks, of what I shared during my homily at that Mass on Sunday. So, first of all, I think it's important for us to hear Jesus' words because remember that the Jews at the time, they would have thought that if someone was born blind, it was because of some sin of their parents, probably, or perhaps later if they became blind, some sin of their own. And so they ask, well, who sinned, Rabbi, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus said, neither he nor his parents sinned. It's so that the works of God might be made visible through him. Some people might ask, well, is it because we're sinners that the coronavirus has come to us? Well, there might be some fatalists who consider that. We don't think that's an answer because I believe with any kind of darkness that we experience, just like this man's blindness was darkness for him. So Jesus is saying to us that it is so that the works of God might be made visible through us. What a thought, because the reality is Jesus presents himself as our light and our salvation. He is light and salvation to this blind man. He is our light and salvation. So notice, even when he comes to be able to see physically, he still is not quite sure who Jesus is until he's enlightened by Jesus at the end. And in fact, he says, I do believe, Lord because he says, you have seen the Messiah, the Son of Man. So, my dear friends, the reality is that just as in St. Paul's letter to the Ephesian, which was our second reading, we hear, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for light produces every kind of goodness, righteousness, and truth. Especially in this moment of great trial for all of us, physical, mental, spiritual, all of us in Christ Jesus are called to be light to others. We are to be his light in this time.
time of darkness. And just as in the end, we know when he did tell people who cured him, he identified Jesus. And what did they do? They cast him out. We're told they threw him out. If we are light for others, folks, we might be thrown out because of our authentic witness to Jesus. But in this dark time, what could we possibly need more than the authentic witness of Jesus' compassion, love, healing, goodness, forgiveness for us and for others? So in that way, I invite you to recognize those words that we heard in the very first reading, which was from the book of Samuel, when we know that Jesse and his sons came to the sacrifice and Samuel looked at El El Eliab and he thought, well, surely the anointed is here. But in fact, we learn quickly, but the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge from his appearance or his stature because I've rejected him. Not as man sees does God see because man sees the appearance, but the Lord looks into, his, uh, into the heart. So in this time of great trial and darkness, I'm inviting all of you, allow the Lord to look into your heart. Don't worry about the appearances of what we may think or judge, but worry about allowing the Lord to look into your heart and allow his light to penetrate your heart so that in these dark times, we may know his light and salvation and be that light and salvation to others. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Bishop. With that, uh, we will take a uh, short break and return with more of your questions. Here Please the- stay with us, folks, as we address this coronavirus tragedy. Thank you to Rieger's Church Supplies and Religious Gifts, the official sponsor of the Bishop's Corner videos. Rieger's is located at 4100 Secor Road in Toledo. Call 419-474-474. 4740 or visit on the web at Riegers.com. Welcome back once again to the Bishop's Corner here on Annunciation Radio. Bishop Daniel Thomas, always eager to answer your questions. Hey, greetings again, everyone. Thank you for being with us. Make sure you get your questions to us. Uh, just use the Bishop's Corner link on AnnunciationRadio.com or the app. Uh, or email your questions to bishop at annunciationradio.com. And uh, as always, Bishop, uh, thanks again for answering these questions. And we have uh, we have several, so we'll get right to it. And I think we're continuing to, to address, folks, the coronavirus pandemic. And this uh, question comes from Melanie in Defiance. Dear Bishop Thomas, thank you for, for providing Holy Mass for us listeners on Catholic Radio. While not being able to receive the Holy Eucharist is a definite hardship, it's comforting to participate in your beautiful Masses and make a spiritual communion. Will any Holy Week liturgies be broadcast, like Tenebrae? Well, Melanie, thank you so much for that. And I hope you know I'm very grateful to you and so many Catholics who I know are listening on the radio or accessing social media and being able to literally attend Mass virtually, and then make the spiritual communion because they can't physically receive Holy Communion. Please know, folks, also on our diocesan website, and I put it on all my social media, we have a wonderful article by one of our seminarians, Alex Elfrick. It's entitled Communion in Quarantine, A Way to Pray. And he very beautifully lays out what a spiritual communion is, and then he also gives a prayer for spiritual communion at the end and gives a way to make an act of spiritual communion. So I invite you to look at that. And I'm so grateful to Alex for providing that for our whole diocese. Please know that we're going to make every effort just as I did this past Sunday. And I, I will the Sundays to come, we're going to make every effort to live stream from our cathedral chapel all of the Holy Week liturgies. And please know that I expect many of your parishes, folks, more than half, probably 65% of our parishes, as we speak, are doing that across the board. So a lot of people feel more connected to their parish. And please know, I feel connected to you by offering you these things. Tenebrae, unfortunately, Melanie, is going to be canceled. First, because, of course, it usually takes 800 people. 
as well as our choir. And so because of the nature of it, and it is not, remember, one of the liturgies of Holy Week, it's a paraliturgy, which we all have come to love, but because it's an added extra, so to speak, we've made the prudent decision to cancel that because it wouldn't be possible to be able to produce it as we would these other sacred liturgies, which are essential in Holy Week. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you, Melanie. For Thank that. you from Defiance. Great question there. Uh, let's move on to uh, Robert in Toledo, who writes, Dear Bishop Thomas, with the current suspension of public masses, I've developed a new Lenten practice of listening to the daily mass as well as Sunday mass on the radio. It's truly great to have our own lo local diocesan mass, and I'm thankful for Annunciation Radio for carrying it. I know the decision to suspend public masses was a difficult one for you and the other Ohio bishops. Did your discussions include possibly how long this will be in effect? Thank you very much, Robert. And in fact, as you know, when the bishops of Ohio together made the decision to do so, we in fact indicated that it was a most difficult decision, and we were heartbroken and saddened to have to do it. But given the health of our nation and the health of our Catholic as well as broader community, we felt it was essential to comply with the governor's decision to try to limit and to curb the extent of this virus. Uh, you should also know, Robert, you may not have seen the press statements that went out from the bishops because we indicated how long that will last. So not only did we discuss it, it's already been published now for some time that right now, as of this moment, it will be in effect through up to and including Easter Sunday. What we're hearing is that this is going to last much longer, so there may be updates regarding that. So as of this moment, that's the case. And just for all our folks, and I appreciate, Robert, you're listening on radio. Remember, and I think it's, is it around 3 p.m., Ron, that this is? Uh, About 3.15, right after the Divine Mercy Chapel. So around 3.15 p.m., folks, the daily mass from Rosary Cathedral Chapel, which takes place now, of course, privately at 7 a.m., is taped and then broadcast at 315 on Annunciation Radio. Monsignor Kubaki, the rector, Monsignor Borger, a vicar for clergy, and myself are taking turns being the celebrant of that Mass, and that's broadcast daily. And we are also, through so many of our parishes, broadcasting Masses literally live and then also taped. So that it's available on so many platforms, and I'm so grateful that people are tuning in and experiencing Holy Mass from their homes. You know, in between the uh, live-streamed Masses, um, both video and the, the, the Masses on radio, it, it strikes me that even in difficult times, especially in difficult times, grace is flow as well. And of course, the reality is that God's grace is not limited, and therefore that's why the spiritual communion is so important. Because even if, though we can't receive the sacred host or the precious blood into our human bodies, we can receive grace flowing from the sacrament. And what a gift, folks, that our priests are continuing daily to offer the sacred mass, to unite themselves with all our parishioners, as I am united with all the members of the flock of our diocese, as we offer Holy Mass, and as we receive the sacred Eucharist, remembering all of you in our prayers. And Bishop, I think we got time for one more question. Please do, Ron. This is from Eileen at St. Joseph Maumee. Yes. Your Excellency, how do you think Pope Francis is doing dur during this coronavirus pandemic? Is his leadership affected, and is he well? Thank you, Eileen. Uh, we have no reports uh, to indicate that he is not well. Uh, we've already said, I believe, on this program, we know that the Holy Father comes in a very compromised category of persons, demographic, because he himself is elderly in his 80s, and he also is only has the capacity of one part of one lung because of a surgery early on when he was young. So the reality is, Eileen, I am sure, even as we've seen in some of his masses and homilies, this is affecting him greatly. He has the world on of the burden of this in his prayer and on his shoulders, and we know he has already responded in many ways to reaching out for people. We've just heard that he's going to offer a special Orbi at Orbi blessing. He's already offered prayers for plenary indulgences for those who are ill and those caring for them. And he's already ordered special directives regarding the reception of the sacrament of penance. So Pope Francis is very 
involved in this pandemic and is clearly praying for all of us and especially affected because we know how deeply affected the whole country of Italy has been in this crisis. And with that, Bishop, we're out of time. I want to thank you for your very timely and very informative uh, Bishop's Corner today. Thank you, Ron. And we're hope, hopeful that all of this is helpful to our folks as we stand together firm in faith, hope, and love as we face this crisis together. And let's pray the closing prayer then from this last Sunday's Mass. Let us pray. O oh God, who through your word reconcile the human race to yourself in a wonderful way, grant, we pray, that with prompt devotion and eager faith, the Christian people may hasten toward the solemn celebrations to come. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Bishop. Thank, Thank you, you for Ron. listening. Thank you for viewing. And uh, we'll be back next week with another edition of the Bishop's Corner. And Ron, just to remind our folks, they can access also a weekly video from me during this period of, of a message to all of our Catholic faithful on our diocesan website and on my Facebook page. And those are very comforting. Please, God. Thank, Thank you for being with us, folks. Join us again next week. Right here, Ron, as you would say, on the Bishop's, Bishop's Corner. Corner. Thank you.